for, for planning. Uh, on, the, folk, on the, the topic of energy, the second was on solar, the third was on fine energy financing and the state energy plan, and, uh, th and this evening we'll, we're going to be talking about biomass. The last event in the series uh, will be focusing on energy efficiency, weatherization, and conservation, and that'll take place on December 13th. Um, this evening uh, we are going to have four different presentations. Um, we'll be going uh, more like a about 8, 8.45 or so um, is what we're aiming for. Uh, the first will be uh, a Matter Valley biomass analysis. It's a summary of work related to a community biomass project, a partner project of UVM, Family Forests, and the National Forest Alliance. Uh, we'll hear from Cecilia Danks and Susanna McCandless, both uh, PhDs for, uh, from the University of Vermont. Um, we'll next hear from Kimberly Coleman, who is doing her thesis project at UVM uh, in the Natural Resources Department on uh, a, a project that came out of the project, uh, and that's related to Harwood Union Forest uh, Project. Our third presentation will be Dave Frank from Sunwood Biomass. We'll be uh, providing uh, an overview of different biomass uh, units uh, and, uh, and different types of heating systems, from chips to pellets. And then lastly, we'll hear from Galen Brown, uh, part of the Compost Power Network, who will be talking about the uh, Woody Biomass Comp project uh, that he um, has been doing on his own property and also at, um, in other areas in Vermont, um, heating with wood without burning wood. So uh, we'll be, like I said, roughly uh, about an hour, about an hour and 20 minutes or so uh, will be the presentations. We'll do, be doing them back, and then at the end we will have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. So without further ado, um, I'm going to have Cecilia and or Susanna come up. Hi, I'm Cecilia Yanks. Um, should I use, I use the recorder? Should I use that or should I yes. just talk? It would be great if you use the microphone for the time this course. Yes. Um, Thank you. All right. Um, hi, good evening. Um, oh, how do I get mine up? You're going to do that. Okay. While it's coming up, um, we put some little index cards around and hope that um, people can use them throughout the evening tonight. Um, I'll ex be explaining a little bit later in the presentation, but I'd like your input on what questions you have around wood biomass energy and whether there are any research needs that you um, anticipate. If you don't have a writing implement, we have a bunch over there and we can bring one to you. If you don't have a card, we have extra cards in the front. So um, any... Uh, Anybody want a card or a pen? So again, you can write questions whether we answer them or not that you're interested in um, about wood biomass energy. And um, I'll collect them at the end. If you want an answer to your questions, you can add an email address and we'll do the best we can. Otherwise, we're going to be using them for a research project around um, community information needs in wood biomass energy. All right. <clears throat> So I point this at that one and it goes, excellent. So obviously there's growing interest in using um, wood and other forms of biomass for energy, not only for the increasing price of fuel, but also concerns around climate change and um, even the interest in just going local in your energy sources. And in fact, uh, ener wood energy use is increasing. There are some people who study wood use who said nationwide we're using um, now actually more wood for energy than we were in the 1800s when wood was the primary source of energy. Um, and um, 15, a little over 15% of um, homes heat with, um, primarily in wood, with wood. That's primarily with wood. Um, a much greater number use wood sometimes for a supplemental amount. And Vermont is the um, highest in terms of wood burning in, this, um, in the United States for home heating. And um, they've gone up in the past 10 years. Um, they're in the 40 to 60 percent category, the highest category of increases in wood, um, wood energy use. Um, not just homes, but schools, various kinds of institutions, government buildings are looking at wood not only for heat, but for cogeneration of electricity and wood and uh, heat. But there are a lot of questions. We look around us, we see green forests, but um, we think they're growing, we think there's a lot in Vermont, but, you know, is wood um, energy really sustainable? Is it really green? And under what conditions are that, are, is it? 
And so some of the things that um, contribute to that understanding of is it sustainable are looking at the climate impacts of wood energy, the harvest impacts, um, whether we the amount of wood supply we have versus demand, you know, air quality, efficiency of various technologies, efficiency of um, how we heat or use energy already, and of course um, their equity and affordability issues. So um, the, the Community Biomass Program is one of two projects um, that I've been involved with in the last two years at UVM who are, that are really looking at the question of what are the information, support, and resources that communities need to explore this issue of um, wood energy as a viable energy alternative. And we're also seeking to identify what are the roles of the university, which is diverse. We teach, we do research, we do extension. What are the roles of the university in helping communities make those decisions? <clears throat> and we wanted to do that not in an ideal sense, not in a, you know, average list of things you should think about when you need wood bio, when you're considering wood biomass energy, but do that by actually working um, on the ground looking at two real contexts, two clusters of communities in Vermont. Um, one in Addison County, um, a five-town area, we call the five-town forest, and the other is here in the Mad River Valley, um, where we've been working for the past um, three years or so. Um, initially with the Northern Forest Alliance, they closed their doors, but um, Tara Hamilton had been helping us um, through them to help understand uh, wood energy issues here. And in general, we're seeking to um, assess the options um, for sustainably producing, procuring, utilizing um, local wood for heating. UVM, um, both the Extension and the Rubenstein School have been involved and we brought in technical partners um, that work nationally, the um, Forest Guild and um, Burke. <clears throat> and so in this project of the past three years, we've done um, a series of studies in each of these two areas, looking first at, um, say, wood demand through a consumption survey that we did, looking at wood supply through GIS analysis, do, doing a landowner survey, um, understanding the supply chain or how loggers um, help provide wood um, sources, uh, criteria and indicators for sustainability, and then um, being involved in two uh, demonstration projects. What we don't cover, we don't, there's a lot of things actually we don't cover, and one big whole category is conversion technologies. And I understand there's other people um, this evening who will be talking about that, but that's one thing we did not look at specifically. We really did, though, just focus on wood for thermal um, purposes for heating. Um, in order to understand a little bit more about consumption of wood and wood products, um, we did a, a survey of the, these nine towns um, that was conducted in the winter of 2009. We got about 410 responses from handing out surveys in various um, community venues. That covers about 77% of households. And we found of respondents, about 69% were heating with wood, either partially or entirely, their homes. Um, you know, given that maybe for uh, Washington County, I think is equal, it's about 15.1% of families um, in the census heated primarily with, with wood. We thought it might be skewed towards the number, towards people who were filling up the survey who were already um, interested in wood heat. Um, but it could well be that around 70% because of backup and double systems that we have here in, the, in um, Vermont, it could well be that it's more representative than we originally thought. Um, only 5% heated with pellets, the rest used um, firewood, um, but 44% were interested in pellet options. In the Mad River Valley, um, the respondents were burning about 3.7 cords uh, per year. 73% had of those had bought who were heating with wood, bought wood in the previous year. 62% harvested themselves, and this is actually um, nationwide. Forest Service studies show the majority of people that heat with wood actually harvest at least some of the wood themselves. 55% um, from their own land, 22% from somebody else's forest. Um, they paid about 2.32 per um, cord for dry cord, and spent about 4.56 um, that year. Um, so they obviously were getting some wood that they weren't paying for. <clears throat> In terms of their preferences around um, uh, if they were to purchase wood, they were very interested, um, 
86% in knowing that environmental quality was protected in the way the wood was grown and harvested. 80% um, that aesthetic and recreational um, uh, values were respected. 78% were um, concerned that a fair price was paid to those harvesting. Um, and about 66% were interested in local sources. So those are all fairly high. 66% were also interested in participating in some kind of um, assuring access um, for affordable firewood. So firewood is also the cheapest um, per BTU um, source of heating in Vermont. Um, and one of our demonstration projects explored community supported firewood and, and almost half of people were interested in exploring that issue. Sort of like community supported agriculture, you would be helping to pay up front to assure a sustainable supply of high quality um, firewood. To understand supply, we asked Mark Lapin, who is a GIS specialist at Middlebury College, um, to help do an assessment. Um, based on that, this is the Mad River Valley map. Um, and the first project was to come up with what are the suitable forest land area. So we excluded everything that wasn't, um, that wasn't uh, either limited or very limited. It's a category of forestry productivity of the land from um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. We eliminated slopes greater than 30 percent. Um, water wetland, a 75-foot buffer around that. Um, areas that had various legal protections or conservation e easements that um, specified they couldn't harvest. And then took out an additional 10% for any unmapped ecological areas that, um, or the road networks to figure out what was at least the land area that would be available. And then we did um, a couple of growth estimates, um, took in, taking an average. Um, we, we looked at a series of, of studies that have done for Vermont and took a low average of 1.2 green tons per acre per year and a high of, what do I have there, 1.7 green tons per acre. Um, and then forest um, biomass usually comes from low quality wood. It's a byproduct in many cases of a timber harvest, unless you're just going out to get firewood. And so um, then we just looked at um, a low estimate of 38% of low quality wood, 58% of high quality, um, and then assumed that the entirety of what was grown then, that you know, once we've removed all these different kinds of, um, of, uh, uh, of the land area, that 100% of this annual growth was harvested and trying to figure out, okay, what's the absolute maximum supply with basic ecological safeguards? And we came up with about 68% of the Mad River Valley um, forest land is suitable for um, harvest by those screens. And um, with the grow cal calculations, the low end of 23,000 and 50,000 green tons per year of low quality wood uh, was the estimated you know, annual uh, production. And how does that compare? Well, a green ton, um, it's hard to compare a, a weight to a volume. Depends on how much the wood weighs. It's different for different species. But it's about um, 0.4 cords is one green ton. So that uh, with 19, 1,960 households in uh, the Mad River Valley, there's around somewhere between 4.7 and 10.2 cords per household um, that's been produced, being produced. So if you're looking to source locally, um, a little more than uh, the houses that are consuming use and um, so it's clearly if everybody decided to heat only with wood next year you could probably do it within what's being um, grown this year. Ecologically. Ecolo just putting the yeah the ecological screens on you know not assuming other things that we'll talk about um, because as we said earlier from the other survey about um, 3.7 uh, cords per year are being used by Mad River Valley residents that heat with wood. However, and um, Harvard Union School Campus has um, uses around 900 tons. Is that about it? Ray would know. Green tons a year. Yes. Um, so that's also well within the growth areas. But if there is a major um, institution that decided to switch to wood heat or combine heat and power, similar to um, Middlebury College. They consume about 20,000 tons a year, and that would be the entire, um, you know, ecologically available um, annual growth in the Mad River Valley area, in an area that um, has a high percentage of forests that's suitable for growth and a low population. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking of, 
this was one of the take home messages from the study is even though we think there's a lot of wood out there, there's not as much as you think if there is some suddenly a wholesale um, movement towards wood biomass energy. And there are other screens besides these ecological screens on wood availability. Just looking at wood supply, there are also social issues. Does a landowner really want to harvest? How much would they harvest? What kind of harvest? And there's issues of economic viability. So that's why we also did the landowner survey and um, an interview study of loggers. I want to check my time here. I'm going to race through this. But um, the, uh, we did a mail survey of the landowners. Um, we got a, almost a 20% response rate. 20% um, uh, of all households that own more than five acres in the two um, community cluster areas responded, and that's 4% of all, all households in both communities combined. And we found that actually 75% of landowners have harvested it sometime since they've owned their land. They've done a timber harvest. Um, and and uh, in the Mad River Valley, half of the owners actually participated in that harvest. Um, most of those harvests were probably firewood. So 66% um, have harvested firewood, 11 have sold, 40 have let other people harvest firewood there. 34% have um, had actual timber sales with saw logs, veneer, or pulpwood. And um, let me see, Mad River Valley, 43% have harvested um, saw timber for their own use. So people are harvesting. It's pretty high harvest rates. Um, and they're most, the two most uh, common plans when we asked about their plans for the land in the next five years, uh, number one was they were planning to harvest firewood, 64 percent, and number two was recreation. Um, we attempted to contact all of the loggers we could identify in the two community areas and interview everybody who was willing to be interviewed. We ended up with um, about 15 folks um, who work as either loggers, processors, um, in one case, uh, somebody primarily a truck driver. Some do both their own trucking and logging. Um, most of them are small scale. There were two large scale operators that had employees and were well mechanized. Of the three processors, two were also large scale, um, dealt with multiple products. <clears throat> we have a bunch of fact sheets available in the back. We tried to distill some of these individual studies into about five fact sheets. and. Um, I, I really encourage you to see it. The logger one is particularly informative, and there, there's some complex um, market chains that go into supplying biomass. But commercial biomass is um, tied to timber sales and to timber prices. And so interestingly enough, um, biomass prices go up or biomass is less available when um, the economic crisis hit and when um, timber harvests are in decline because they're a byproduct of timber. It's just something to keep in mind. We also found that scale is very important to whether you can anticipate local, bio, local benefits. So if you think, you know, going to wood biomass, it's green and it's um, local and it's sustainable. Well, it might not be local unless it's also um, done at a small scale. Um, and we did find that some of the small scale operators turned to this energy wood, wood for either firewood or pellet um, production, um, to maintain their livelihoods when um, timber prices were low. We found that um, loggers, small and uh, large scale, could participate um, in the firewood market and do. But for chips, which are what institutions typically use when they convert to biomass, really only um, large scale um, processors and loggers could participate. And that's um, for a number of reasons. Um, because it was ch generally heavily mechanized, or at least a high capital cost to the machinery that can create chips. Um, demand is a bit volatile. It has to be on demand. It's a great deal of seasonality that may or may not match when they're logging. Um, and there are supply challenges that they've um, admitted to in terms of meeting demand when um, sawmill prices are, are low because their saw logs are really what pays for them to get their machinery to the woods. <coughs> um, we chose to do um, a couple of demonstration projects, one of which was um, called Neighborwood in Vermont Family Forest. As I mentioned before, was trying to do a um, community-supported agriculture uh, style firewood production um, process that really um, produced according to self, their sustainable, efficient, local, and fair criteria. We also have a sheet on that that explains how that went and so some of the pricing and the other issues that made it um, work economically or where they found difficulties. 
But what we have found was that to try and achieve those self goals of all of those components of sustainability, um, it really required paying a little bit more per cord than people were used to. They ended up selling them not as um, dry delivered cut split um, cords, which would have paid more, but as green six foot logs um, that were delivered within a 15 mile radius. And that was around $150 a cord. And that was able to cover um, doing, you know, very best practices on the land in terms of harvest and um, paying the logger um, a fair wage. Um, another um, issue that we looked at, or another case that we looked at, was, well, how we started off looking at it is, well, okay, wh what would institutional procurement look like? So if the, the, um, the neighborhood was looking at um, household law, um, firewood um, procurement, what about institutional procurement? Now, both our, our communities had, um, had schools that were heated with wood. And so we approached Harwood. Um, and we asked Burke to do a little assessment of where their supply was coming from and what would it take to make it greener, make it more sustainable over time. Um, and so uh, uh, Burke did a study that included um, templates and recommendations. And so we went to meet with Ray and some others, uh, the principal at the, at the school, and discuss this. And they brought up something we didn't know, that the school owned a 180-acre forest. And um, the discussion then turned from, you know, how can we change uh, procurement which isn't necessarily easy, that easy. There's a lot of um, uh, issues in getting the right kind of chips at the right time at the right price. But how can we um, understand and study for sustainability, connect it with the curriculum, connect it with the local forest, and maybe over time uh, connect it with the issue of more sustainable um, biomass? And that's what Kim will be talking about in the next talk. <coughs> um, one of the things that we were, um, in the end, that was both in our initial proposal and in the end we found really important was understanding those criteria and indicators that would help communities make choices that are sustainable over the long time. You know, what kind of help can we get around that? And so initially we looked broadly at things like Forest Stewardship Council certification, the Montreal Protocols for Northern Temperate and Boreal Forests, um, and various human health um, regulations from EPA that look um, nationally and internationally at what makes good forestry and what makes um, good biomass um, technology. We also looked locally. We're concerned about what's important to community members. And Vermont Family Forest has um, facilitated a discussion to understand, and that's how they came up with SELF, the Sustainable, Efficient, Local, and Fair. They tried to um, figure out what was ecologically important and um, what was socially important in their community and were able to use their town forest checklist as one way to, um, to describe what they were looking for ecologically. Um, and we also looked ahead as this project evolved, the Forest Guild, which is a national organization, been working on a project in Massachusetts trying to develop biomass um, harvest guidelines. And um, throughout this time, the Vermont Bioenergy Committee of the um, state legislature has also been working on both procurement and harvest guidelines. Their um, document is actually coming out for public review this week. I believe it's this week or next week. Um, and it's about, um, I don't know, somewhere between 40 and 80 pages if you count all the tables. Um, and I would encourage folks who are interested to uh, look for that. And we looked at procurement um, options, um, similar to what we described for, for Harwood. And what we found was that none of these were covering all the aspects of sustainability um, that really need to be considered. In particular, issues of um, what's the impact on climate? Is wood energy really climate neutral? And it's kind of complex. Some of it has to do with the timing. So if we're using um, you know, wood and the technology, so if we are all of a sudden harvesting wood now, we're actually releasing a lot of carbon that was captured in these forests. And do we want to release it now, even though it'll grow back, do we want to release it now or we want to release it later? Because fossil fuels can produce more BTUs per carbon released. So, um, you know, there are those issues and it's not entirely clear what's the best thing, even from a climate standpoint. Efficiency is obviously at the very top of the list. Um, first off, and just you know, conservation using less energy overall is obviously your best um, choice. But there are also efficiency issues involved in which um, conversion technology. So just to say, would you know, would biomass energy good, bad over what time frame isn't even enough. You really need to know what um, the technology is. 
and the health issues and affordability issues um, are also, there's really no uh, clear comprehensive guidelines and certainly none that Paul leads all together. <clears throat> So um, part of the, by finding these questions that arose in these projects in these two communities and thinking and looking for the resources, trying to pull them together, what communities could use, um, led to the proposal um, for a biomass energy research symposium. Again, looking to what's the role of university, at least in their research capacity. Um, so Kim and I um, led a, a symposium last spring, uh, with, which drew in people from, uh, researchers from throughout New England and several um, provinces in Canada to look at a whole host of these categories. No, by no means all of them, but issues of wood supply, greenhouse gas accounting, the harvest impacts, um, criterion indicators, soil carbon, air quality, and in particular something I'm interested in, decision support to communities. And we found that first there's a lot of research going on out there. Um, but anecdotally we're finding that not a lot of the research findings are meeting communities. When we talk to groups that have sort of explored issues, many times the information sources are the people maybe selling a given technology or, um, and that can be problematic because the way um, certain, uh, the, the forest industry calculates wood supply is not the same way with the same ecological safeguards that many of the forest ecologists do. <coughs> And so this brings us to the little um, pieces of um, uh, index cards. I'm hoping to get your input. And we, through that meeting and with um, some discussions around that symposium, we were asking um, for, from a community's perspective what the research and information needs. And so if people write those down, we'll sort of add that into that pile. And if, um, if anybody, a couple of people might have come in later, there's um, little cards. You can write it on any sheet of paper, any um, questions you may have that might you know, be research already have research on it or might um, we could add as to the list of research needs. Some of the ones that came out were additional data and models on decision support. <coughs> and that, so again, that's my, my cue to myself to ask you to write down any questions you might have about wood biomass energy. And I want to thank everybody involved in the project to date. Um, there are actually lots of people. Um, that participated. Some of you may have filled out surveys or interviews. Um, we got funding from the Northeastern States Research Cooperative. There are all these um, folks from UVM, various partners, graduate students have been involved over the past few years. And um, sorry, I'm trying to get backwards now. It's not going backwards. Oh, I wanted to say if you're looking for more information, um, we will. We have an. an, an fair number of um, documents up and we'll be posting more to this website. So it's uvm.edu slash forest carbon slash biomass. Oh, and it's on the fact sheets if you want to grab one. So I think I did it in time. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. All right. I'm Kim Coleman. I'm one of Cecilia's graduate students, and I'm going to do sort of a, a quick 10-minute extension on her presentation specifically about um, the work that's being done at Harwood Union High School um, right now. So as Cecilia said, interest in heating with woody biomass is growing. Many communities are looking to the forest as a way to meet their energy needs. And in particular, schools in Vermont are really looking to woody biomass as a way to meet their energy needs. Um, in Vermont, about 45 schools currently heat with biomass. This is a, a map from Biomass Energy Resource Center in Montpelier, Burke, um, of all the schools that heat with biomass currently in Vermont. You can see there's, there, there's a, a lot in there distributed all over the state. One of those schools is Harwood Union High School it's here in the valley located in South Duxbury. Educates 7th through 12th graders from six towns. Um, and it made the decision to switch to wood heat as part of the Fuels for Schools program. So that's a, a federal program that subsidizes um, um, the, the switch from fossil fuel to wood heat. Um, and as Cecilia mentioned, 
Harwood got connected with UVM and Cecilia's research group through this community biomass project that was going on here in the Valley and in Addison County. So Cecilia talked about a little bit of this, but I'll just go um, through it again just to make sure everybody understands. So Burke, that's the Biomass Energy Resource Center in Montpelier. They prepared a report for Harwood that looked at procurement options, issues around sustainable procurement of chips, um, where the chips are coming from, that sort of thing. Um, and as Cecilia mentioned, as part of these conversations, we, um, the fact that Harwood had their own forest came up and would it be possible to source some of their own chips because that would ultimately be like the real local fuel supply, right? Um, and then what other sorts of opportunities existed for Harwood to take advantage of given that they owned 180 acre forest? So to sort of address some of these questions, um, we formed a partnership. We're calling it the Harwood Union Forest Project. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So at the time that this, con this initial conversation happened, Harwood didn't have a management plan. Um, there were lots of people using the forest. Um, one individual sort of doing rogue silviculture in the forest, um, but no set plan of how the forest was managed and how it should be managed into the future. And that was something that the school was really interested in, in doing, writing a stewardship plan, um, a collaborative stewardship plan that took into account all the different various uses um, and people's goals and objectives for how they wanted to see the forest used into the future. Um, so that was one of the, and still is one of the major goals of the project. And then beyond that, being that it's a school, um, and a school in a, a state that's predominantly forested, what education opportunities exist to get students out into the woods and learning about forest sustainability? So that's the second goal. And so this has been going on for about a year now, this project, and we've had a lot of really great accomplishments so far. So I'm gonna run through a list of them and then I'll elaborate on, um, just sort of give you a, a a peek at one project in particular to give you a little bit more detail on, on one particular thing. Um, so as I mentioned, we've established goals and objectives. Um, that was done collaboratively through a, a lot of meetings and feedback and circulations of documents. Um, gathering stakeholder feedback happened through surveys. That was both to get people's opinions about how they were currently using the forest and how they wanted to see the forest used in the future, and also to gauge teacher interest to see who's currently teaching with forest-based education um, techniques and who would want to do more. And for the folks who want to and aren't doing it right now, what do they really need in the form of support to, to help them get out in the woods and get their students out in the woods? Um, and so we, we heard a, a whole list of things related to that, um, what teachers needed to really, to really engage their students with the forest more. And so from that, came up with a list of objectives of things that we could do to support teachers in forest-based education opportunities. Um, so one of, that, one of those things was workshops. Um, in particular, how can we incorporate some hard skills like mapping and delivered a couple workshops on using Google Earth and Google Maps in the classroom, as well as project, a Project Learning Tree workshop, which is um, a national organization that does curricular development around forest-based ed. We've had several partnerships between um, individual courses at UVM and individual courses at Harwood, so university students working with 7th through 12th grade students um, to address a number of objectives um, that were outlined in our action plan. And at UVM, we call that service learning. It basically just means that students in academic classes are going out beyond campus walls um, and applying some of what they're learning in the classroom in a real world setting, getting some practical hands-on experience. Um, so some of the classes that have participated at Harwood have been the pre-tech outreach class, seventh grade science, and 12th grade science. Some of the classes that have participated at UVM have been coursework in um, environmental problem solving, sustainability education, community forestry, um, community-based research. Um, I think that's it to date. Um, two master's theses are underway, including my own. Uh, the other one is a student who's actually gonna be involved more heavily with the writing of the management plan, and that's his thesis. Um, 
it's actually more than three UVM faculty that have gotten involved at this point, either um, doing the workshops um, or just uh, you know providing the opportunity for their students to do um, the service learning projects for coursework. Um, we've also involved a number of teachers at Harwood Union High School, including Ray, who's the facilities manager, um, folks from Burke, as we mentioned, uh, the Russ Bear at the Washington County Forester, um, and also David Brin, I think, has been involved a little bit, although his name's not up here from Vermont Family Forest. Um, so we currently have an action plan, and the, the writing of the stewardship plan is underway. So that's, that's actually, I think, a lot of work done in, in about a year. So I'll just talk a little bit about one particular service learning project to give you a better idea of the type of stuff that's going on at the school right now. Um, one of the really exciting projects that happened this fall um, sort of came out in response to Irene. Um, as many of you know, there's been a lot of debate around how um, handle, how the state has handled some of the, the stream work in the streams. Um, and so you may know that hydrology and, and forestry are very interconnected and the forest has a big impact on streams and streams have a big impact on their forests. And so um, a group of students from UVM who are taking a sustainability education class partnered with um, a teacher at Harwood Union High School who's um, teaches seventh grade science, and then um, a member of the Mad River Valley community who works for Friends of the Mad River, um, and all got together to do this project teaching the seventh grade students about watershed science and watershed literacy and how watersheds affect forests and forests affect watersheds and how this has all changed because of Irene. Um, and so not only did they do this project to teach the students about it, but they actually held uh, an event where the students then educated community members about what they had learned and then did um, a big cleanup day. So I'll show you a picture of the cleanup day in a second. Um, but this was really an example of um, an opportunity where university students who you know, are interested in sustainability education are sort of the next generation of environmental educators had an opportunity to get some hands-on experience working with kids, um, got to teach kids some, some hard skills and knowledge. The seventh graders got to learn this great information and then share it in their community. They got to do some direct service and cleaning up the stream. Then um, they provided a service for Friends of the Mad River as well by doing this outreach that they may not have had the capacity to do otherwise. So there's the picture of the stream cleanup day and all the stuff they pulled out. And that's just one example of the projects um, that have happened at Harwood. There have been others that have looked at um, the inventory of the forest. What do we have in the forest? If we're going to write this management plan, we need to know what we've got going on so far. So the work that those students did will actually be included in the management plan, which is pretty cool for high school students to be able to say that they've contributed to an actual management plan that's in use. Um, other students are working right now with a 12th grade class and um, similarly looking at issues around um, river change and and actually learning some hard mapping skills using Google Earth and Google Maps that are very similar to skills that are used um, in GIS, which is a, you know, a really sort of um, marketable skill for students thinking about careers and the environment and forestry. So some great projects going on. So next steps. Finishing um, the management plan will be a major goal of this year that my fellow graduate student who couldn't be here tonight because he just had a baby will be working on. Um, uh, really sort of working on getting feedback on the goals and objectives for the management plan and then putting a, um, a public uh, draft in circulation for comment among all the stakeholders. Um, engaging more students um, through service learning partnerships were a big thing that we heard from teachers through the survey was that they would be more likely to use the forest if the trail network was mapped and labeled. Um, and so involving students in um, mapping and labeling the forest both so that the teachers can use the forest more readily but also so that students can learn those hard mapping skills. Um, and providing additional workshops for teachers, um, potentially more some project learning tree workshops. 
So the big takeaway message, I think, for me and how this all relates back to biomass is that, as I, as I said in the first slide, many schools are heating with wood now. Um, and I think as schools heat with wood, it, it provides an opportunity um, to start getting students thinking about what it means that a school heats with wood. Where does, our, where does our heat come from? What are the implications of our energy use? And then more than that, um, starting to talk to students about, okay, we're heating with wood and we want to heat with wood sustainably. What does that mean? And what potential careers exist or college tracks? And really, the service learning interactions have allowed us um, to get students interacting with university students, hearing about what university students are doing, and then thinking about potential career tracks for them. So it really offers an opportunity to engage students and school communities in this thought process around sustainable forestry. And I think in a state like Vermont, where it is so heavily forested and many people do make a living in the woods, exposing students to these opportunities um, and sort of career and college tracks early on can be a really valuable thing. So I just want to say thank you to Ray Daigle, who's in the audience, Graham Leitner, who again couldn't be here, and all the other folks that have been involved in this project, and Cecilia and all the faculty who have taken time and committed thought to this project, um, and National Life, who gave us a, a little grant to do some of the workshops. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Frank. I know many of you, <clears throat> but what you don't know is that I'm not a, uh, a seasoned public speaker, so bear with me on my, uh, <clears throat> my, my uh, uh, ahs and ahs and general faux pas. I'm with Sunwood Biomass. Um, we're a seven-year-old company out of the valley here. We have 138 uh, installations throughout the state of Vermont. And um, the, it was through the inspiration of my business partner, Mark DiMario, who I sometimes refer to as the mad scientist, uh, and who is also from the Mad River Valley, uh, that we've been able to um, make the progress that we have with uh, biomass heat. In the beginning here, I'm going to touch um, briefly on um, uh, policy and economics, since it is uh, part of the <clears throat> equipment in, on the front end or possibly in the back end uh, when you're paying for it if you borrow money or bond for it. Um, these are the four forms of biomass heat I'm going to talk about. Now, the one that's not so familiar to everybody probably is uh, grass. <clears throat> and wood uh, biomass, while it uh, has a, a quite a bit of um, BTU uh, per pound, um, uh, Grass uh, energy is uh, a developing uh, industry, and there's been quite a bit of money put into it here in Vermont. Vermont's the most uh, uh, progressive state in developing um, the uh, research and applicability for grass energy. Uh, currently, if you were to grow an acre of uh, reed canary grass or switch grass, you could get about the equivalent of uh, three tons, um, or excuse me, three cords of wood from uh, one uh, acre. Um, and it uh, regenerates every year. Um, there's a lot of benefits from it. So uh, to speak just briefly to carbon neutrality of wood, um, the one thing that may not have been expressed is the, the specifics that make uh, wood carbon neutral is the fact that if, in fact, you would leave um, the tree to die in the forest and it rots, um, it's going to produce a form of uh, CO2, um, uh, better known as methane or CH4. And um, that actually is about 20 times um, uh, more damaging to the environment than CO2 is. So uh, through different scientists, mostly in the EU, who have uh, done an extensive amount of research in this area, they've determined that um, the, um, uh, the differential um, is uh, basically neutral. So, um, you know, the, the, these organizations include uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the point uh, group in the Kyoto Protocol, 
the International uh, Council of Climate Change and our own EPA. So currently it's still considered carbon neutral, but there are a lot of issues being debated regarding it. Um, the, on economics, this is a uh, just a quick slide to show you um, regarding uh, fuel oil. <clears throat> You'll see here Vermont, this is uh, first column is uh, uh, general uh, number two household uh, oil. And this is all oil used uh, for heat, thermal heat in Vermont, not transportation. And our average currently is about 130 million gallons a year. Um, so this chart, uh, who I've worked with a gentleman in Maine to develop uh, uh, Bill Strauss of Future Metrics, has um, established if oil goes from, you see the next two columns over, $3 a gallon to four fifty a gallon, um, the differential in the amount of dollars that leave the state between three dollars a gallon and four fifty a gallon is about one hundred and fifty two million dollars so working backwards basically seventy eight percent of all fuel dollars or seventy eight cents of every fuel dollar leaves the state uh, permanently so from the economic side there's a lot of motivation to to do something besides besides all the other reasons. And this last column is a matrix that converts that into jobs, which gets a little bit complicated, but that's uh, the equivalent of 11,000 jobs lost. Um, fuel oil in Vermont, uh, we use uh, uh, a total of 60%, um, and a lot of people in, in Waitsfield use, uh, or in the Matter Valley, I should say, use um, um, <clears throat> uh, LP, uh, so that uh, is 14%. This just gives a little breakdown in that. Uh, another uh, metric that uh, Bill Strauss came up with was uh, specifically driven at wood pellet and wood pellet boilers. And basically, if we were to convert 17% uh, of all homes in Vermont uh, to wood pellet boilers, that would increase uh, uh, additional 7,800 jobs throughout the state, um, direct and ancillary related jobs. <clears throat> So this is your every, oh, first I'm going to go through uh, wood pellet and wood cord stoves. This is your average wood stove everybody's seen. The disadvantages of the wood stove, of course, is it's uh, only heating a very small space. Uh, typically it'll heat up to about 30% of your home unless you happen to have a super insulated or very small home. Uh, you can get creative with it, but in the end, um, it's still only a percentage of your uh, heat use uh, on in the average home. Um, Although that is changing, and this uh, piece of equipment, who, which we don't sell, it's not uh, uh, listed for being sold here in the United States yet, this piece of equipment actually takes hot air off of the uh, pellet stove itself and drives it to other rooms with a very simple <coughs> um, hose system. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, typically, pellet um, fuel is sold in bags. Um, this is a... Um, a standard uh, a, a, a bin built uh, for a home to convert to bulk delivery. That's the direction that uh, pellets are going and have gone in Europe. You, very, you see very few pellet ba uh, pellets being sold by the bag throughout Europe um, compared to uh, the delivery of them by a pneumatic truck which will blow them in. Uh, it's very common uh, throughout the EU. It's like an oil truck just traveling from home to home. Um, these are quick lists. Uh, my presentation is a little long, so I'm going to zip through this. This just gives some basic pros and cons between cord wood and pellet uh, stoves. Um, you know, my my biggest uh, issue with pellet stoves, or pellet, uh, wood, excuse me, uh, firewood uh, stoves is the is the ash and of course the dirty wood in the house. Um, and the fact that you cannot control the temperature of a wood stove like you can a pellet stove. It has a thermostat so you can uh, regulate your temperature and uh, it, it's proven itself to be very, uh, uh, an, a real economical uh, way to go with if you choose to go with pellets. Uh, the payback on it is generally within uh, two or three years. Um, the next thing is here, uh, hot. Uh, th now we're going to boilers and hot air systems. Um, I think most people know the difference. Basically, uh, hot air, you are heating the pellets in a heat exchanger and blowing through a uh, air system in your house. If that happens to be what you already have, a boiler system is uh, hot water. Um, 
if you already have a hot air system, there are systems that can be adapted to a current uh, hot air uh, system for pellets uh, and cord wood as well. Outdoor wood boilers um, is something that we are uh, uh, basically trying to um, uh, bring a higher awareness to. While they are uh, slightly cleaner than they have been in the past, they still have a lot of deficiencies and uh, are, are very still very problematic. While they do the while they do the the um, the trick and have a have a place in in a social economic um, um, you know spot, uh, they they still have a lot of problems. So uh, you know basically they're very inefficient. Um, and they still consume, even the newer ones, about 30% more wood than an efficient or uh, a high efficiency gas uh, uh, gasification wood boiler. Um, so basically when you're looking at any form of biomass equipment besides the percentage of the home that you want to try to cover in your basic budget or depending how far out you're planning, you're looking at the durability of it, the warranty, the efficiency, maintenance and frequency uh, to maintain it and of course that goes with your own skill set or how much you want to bother to have to deal with it and um, the the biggest uh, key is to talk with other owners of the same equipment before you consider it there's a lot of equipment out there that that looks very nice but is also very high maintenance so uh, the brochures certainly don't tell everything uh, this is probably our number one cordwood uh, boiler that we, we like and sell the most. Um, this one's made in Upper Austria. Uh, the uh, obvious uh, primary burning takes place where the, where the wood is. You see a little flame underneath, but unlike a traditional wood stove, instead of the smoke going up, it travels down into a combustion chamber. That combustion chamber is then introduced, um, or what we call a secondary combustion chamber, is introduced with air and it uh, reignites um, at about uh, 1500 degrees. So you're burning off any of the residual gases, leaving um, uh, very, very few volatile uh, gases at all, uh, less than uh, oil, uh, considerably less than oil. Um, and this, this unit burns about 90% efficiency if you have uh, relatively dry wood. Off to the left there, you see heat storage tanks. And the idea of this boiler is that you don't allow it to uh, throttle down to its smoldering like a wood stove would. It burns straight through the pile of wood and drives all the heat to a heat storage tank if, in fact, the house is not calling for uh, heat at that time. That heat then becomes available in those heat storage tanks for later use uh, when the when the house calls for heat or, or domestic hot water. This is another example of uh, one of those units. Uh, this one has the heat storage built into the boiler. Um, so the smallest of these units has 1,500 gallons of water surrounded uh, around the actual uh, burn chamber itself. Uh, this unit's made in um, uh, Minnesota and is extremely efficient. Um, it's one of the few American main units that uh, we really uh, champion. Um, <clears throat> so basically uh, going to uh, uh, pellets means you have to have a, a little better understanding of pellets because right now our regulations in the United States are very lax, unfortunately. So uh, the programs are driven by the manufacturers and of course that means by the largest of all the manufacturers, the ones who want to make the most money and have the lowest level of regulation. So, it is important to become familiar with the standards if you buy wood pellets. If you end up with a lot of uh, fi fines um, and uh, ash, uh, it can be problematic for the, uh, the device, whether it be a boiler or a pellet stove. Um, <clears throat> so the couple things are ideal to look for is the BTU number, 8,000 plus. Uh, you want less than, um, when you get down to the fines, you want less than a half percent or around a half percent. Um, and ash, you want it to be below one percent. Uh, so those are the most critical details, I would have to say, besides the BTU number. And also, most people don't realize that uh, softwood pellets have a higher BTU content than hardwood pellets. Um, this unit is probably one of the most economical conversions for a uh, traditional oil boiler to pellets. It is an insert where your normal oil uh, gun would go. Uh, it's relatively new. It's been out in Europe for some time. 
It's a little bit higher maintenance and a little lower efficiency, but you can put one of these in if it happens to work with your existing oil boiler for about $6,000. Um, so right now that's our, our most economical uh, unit. We've been uh, test driving that one here locally. Um, this is, on the other end of the scale, the most efficient one uh, available now. Uh, it, it pretty pricey, um, but at the same time, it highly reliable, uh, very long warranty, and extremely efficient. So uh, those are the key factors um, that, that we try to promote in all of our equipment. Um, so the storage of pellets uh, by bulk truck, this is one method, which is uh, obviously a silo with, with a auger system that augers the pellets into the top of the silo. The bottom of the silo then draws them out. This is uh, the method I was speaking of earlier that's all throughout Europe. It's a pneumatic fill system. There's about five uh, dealers in the state of Vermont and New Hampshire that are filling pneumatically, and uh, we can't put them in fast enough, basically. And uh, as this catches on more, we'll have less plastic bags for the standard wood pellet stoves because people can build their own bins, as I showed earlier, and have the bins filled uh, by one of these trucks. So it'll be the equivalent of an oil truck. Predominantly throughout Europe, uh, uh, really popular. These are a couple uh, methods of interior uh, storage. The top one is just an interior room built with 45 degree uh, sloping walls to a center auger that then suctions the pellet by a glorified vacuum cleaner to the wood boiler itself, wood pellet boiler. And the same with the other two systems. The underground system, uh, we've never done one. And they're not very common, um, certainly not here yet in the United States. The bag uh, system in the lower left-hand corner is nothing more than a, a textile, heavy textile bag that holds pellets um, and also is blown in as well. It's uh, very economical. Uh, this is just a close-up of the uh, of a pellet room that you may build yourself or have built. Uh, this is another example of a couple bags. Uh, here you have uh, different placements of bags. They can go just about anywhere because of the hose. Uh, the vacuum hoses can draw them down. This is an example of uh, one of our installations that was challenging. Uh, they didn't want a silo exposed on a new building, so we found some unused space. This elevated uh, portion of the building is um, <clears throat> what was going to be a hose drying tower and uh, as it turns out they used synthetic hoses and didn't need it they kept the architectural element and the space became available so that's where we're storing the pellets in that uh, in that tower so uh, just quickly you know if you're sizing any sort of uh, wood system or any heating system efficiency has to be number one if you don't do the retrofits immediately uh, you should at least do the lowest hanging fruit ones which is typically uh, your attic you know and um, I can't uh, implore enough that uh, efficiency has to come first or concurrently um, one thing we do is integrate uh, solar with uh, wood systems uh, it works out great um, and it helps uh, offset the wood system running in the summertime or uh, sometimes not at all if it's sized appropriately. Um, now I'm going to talk uh, quickly about uh, district heat systems. So these are very popular in Europe and uh, barely even catching on here. Um, <clears throat> uh, Montpelier is about to undertake a, a, a complete downtown um, district heat system. It would be very extensive and uh, fairly unique as a matter of fact. Um, so I throughout Europe, one of the things that happens is, is that uh, in this particular uh, instance, uh, there'll be underground hot water pipes that go from building to building. And this one is uh, all on the same property. This is right here in town, obviously. Um, and so that unit, uh, GARN, GARN, uh, is the boiler itself. And then these different uh, buildings are the ancillary buildings that take the heat off of the unit. Um, so in Europe, this is uh, an example of, uh, of, of a system where the homeowners are close to each other within 100 feet or 200 feet at the, out, at the most. And uh, one person owns and maintains the boiler, and the other two people help pay for it. Uh, their capital costs are shared by the three locations. There's incentives throughout uh, Europe to do this, and um, the technology is very mature. Uh, this is an institutional unit that can be brought in and plugged in play. We have 
one of these that is, has a ribbon cutting uh, on Thursday at the Green Mountain Club. Um, and uh, basically, it's a cordwood one, not a pellet one. And uh, it's great because you can build it on site at a shop and then deliver it. Um, this is another unique, challenging installation. Uh, it could be a home, but in this case, it's a it's a it's a, a an old age home, basically, or a elderly housing. We were uh, not able to use the uh, put a silo outside, and um, so we utilized uh, ten existing jail cells uh, in a building that was converted from uh, a prison to elderly housing uh, to store 50 tons of wood pellets. So, well, it's one kind of reform, I guess. So uh, Craftsbury Academy, um, there was no big challenge here, but I put this slide in because I knew that we we're going to do the hardwood uh, thing here tonight. And you know, when we put this boiler, and this is a million BTU boiler, um, and when we put this uh, boiler in at Craftsbury Academy, we found out that they had a, a sustainable forestry class. So uh, we helped them develop that into a full-blown uh, biomass curriculum, which now includes, uh, with Burke, they help fund it. And so um, they now harvest uh, their forest. They actually have 100 acres, and they harvest, which is mostly softwood, and send it to be made for pellets. So uh, the class this past year actually uh, followed the log truck to the Vermont wood pellet to uh, get them converted to uh, or made into pellets and uh, stopped along the way at um, Burke for a class. Uh, so they're going to, it's a pilot project that, uh, that it's, it turned out to be a great thing. Uh, Vermont Technical College is developing a biomass curriculum. Um, we're helping them build out the lab there now, and they, it's about halfway done, uh, it finished. And it's in the basement of this uh, building that they purchased a few years back. It's on the corner of their campus. Um, so there's a lot of progress being made. Um, <clears throat> so now to some uh, resources. Uh, this is available at pelletheat.org if you want to try to uh, look to see what your conversion would be for cost and usage and tonnage or cords. Um, this is an opportunity to, uh, to get a thumbnail look at that. This busy slide is um, uh, some folks that are already highly promoting uh, biomass in the state of Vermont, some public advocacy groups, uh, Vermont Natural Resources, uh, excuse me, Vermont Natural Resource Council and Burke, as well as VPIRG. Uh, VPIRG has a wood heat report that they just put out very extensive. Uh, and VNRC has done some case studies as well as community uh, planning guides for uh, developing wood heat. Um, and um, <clears throat> there's a couple national organizations, but we're still very much behind the, the, uh, the eight ball, about 15 years um, behind Europe. Um, for where they are. So uh, here's a couple of the resources, um, and um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Galen Brown, and I'm here to talk about uh, an old idea that uh, we're trying to make new. Um, uh, CompostPower.org is a nonprofit network of enthusiasts and uh, experimenters that I've kind of started about a year ago. And basically, our concept is figuring out ways to compost shredded woody biomass. Could be bark mulch, it could be wood chips, it could be mixtures of these types of materials uh, while embedding uh, different types of heat exchange water lines usually inside a pile of this material and collecting a lot of heat. Um, and we've had some great success uh, recently. This winter there will be um, anywhere from 10 to 12. There's still a couple projects that are underway of people actually attempting to heat greenhouses uh, and homes or just for domestic hot water uh, through this winter uh, across the Northeast and there's uh, one guy in Minnesota and one uh, monk in Siberia who we've been 
bouncing ideas around with who are trying to make this work. This is a, a picture of what I would call a, a typical uh, residential scale uh, compost power mound. Um, this was built in New Hampshire uh, about a month ago. And um, it looks like this particular one is putting out anywhere between 15 and 25,000 BTUs per hour. We have not had any of these, op this is our first winter where we'll have several systems operating through the winter. So it's still unclear how well it will perform through the winter, what the real BTU value would be. But if this holds up how it's been running uh, the first month of its operation, it will add up to the same amount of BTU energy f that you'd get from burning five cords of firewood in an efficient wood stove. Um, so it's a significant heat value, it looks like. The trick is more on how you use the heat and how your plumbing and circulation systems are integrated into it. He has tied this one into a radiant floor heating system and it's been heating his house um, this winter without his furnace having to run. Um, so if you've got radiant floor heating, it's ideal because the water temperature that we're getting out of these is anywhere from 120 to 140 degrees which is really perfect for radiant floor or domestic hot water. Um, in theory, you can run it through radiators as well, but your radiators would be putting out probably about half the heat that they normally would. So um, plumbing is um, lots of ways to potentially look at it, but um, I think the, the biggest point that we're trying to focus on is that there's another value here that goes beyond heat or energy, and that's the value of the compost. So you know, 12 months or up to 18 months uh, after you build one, it will cool off. The material will have been uh, broken down, uh, composted, turned into uh, soil-ready compost, depending on what, you're, um, what you built it with. And so the value of that is actually immense um, in terms of soil building. The amount of money you might spend on buying the material in the beginning, usually the value of the compost a year later will more than offset that. So for people who are uh, investing in soil fertility, doing greenhouses, farming in any way, homesteading, um, the energy in a sense could be seen as free because you're investing in soil and compost and um, getting energy out of that process. So you know basically the, the big picture thing that we're excited about here is turning forest residue, forest waste, uh, brushwood, things that are actually clogging up our forest and, and uh, potentially making it disease prone and less healthy. Taking that out, composting it, collecting energy, creating soil, and potentially putting that compost back into the forest around your house if you're thinning your own uh, brushwood to encourage the trees that you want and make room for them to grow. Um, in a sustainable way. With this as one of the products, um, high value soil. And I, you know, I think the other the point that we're trying to, to make in terms of getting people excited about what, what this idea could really mean is that we're talking about making soil that allows us to potentially produce food through the winter and winterized greenhouses, um, all without any fossil fuels or with very little fossil fuel in terms of the energy you're getting to keep the greenhouse seed beds warm, uh, in terms of the energy and the value of the compost and the soil, again, without uh, chemical or nitrogen or um, natural gas derived uh, fertilizers. This is a picture of my son taking a bath in a tub um, of 101 degree water that came from my first compost power mound uh, about a year after we first built it. Uh, the first few that we built, we did not quite have success in terms of maintaining heat um, through the winter because we were using wood chips instead of uh, shredded fine grain material. Um, but it, coo it cooled off in the winter and then in the early spring, it got right back up to 100 to 110 degrees. And um, a year later, we were still playing with that hot water and excited about the potential. This is from another recent project, the 160 degrees 
on the uh, temp probe. Most of the uh, mounds that we've uh, assisted with are reading in a range of 140 to 160 degrees anywhere you stick the temp probe into the into the pile. Um, there are several variables that make that uh, work compared to what would make it uh, not get as hot or not stay hot. Uh, and this is the uh, proud owner builder of uh, this recent one in New Hampshire who uh, actually happens to be a solar hot water installer also. So his system is tied into his solar hot water uh, and his radiant floor heating and it's probably one of the ideal uh, scenarios that anyone could, could think of um, just across the border in New Hampshire. This is what it looks like in the beginning. So the first step is about a two foot thick layer of material that um, needs to have some aeration built into it. So the, the principle here is that you need to have a way to get air underneath the whole mound so that air can flow passively up through the mound uh, in a chimney effect. Um, right after one is built, you'll find a hot spot in the top center of the mound, and that's what creates the chimney effect. It basically, heat moves up, and that creates a vacuum that pulls air up through the bottom of the mound, and that aerates the whole system and keeps the microbes happy. Um, in the beginning, you'll want to lay you know, a few feet of material before you start to coil your heat exchange pipes. We've, uh, you can use PEX, you can use poly tubing, one inch diameter, half inch diameter. There's lots of options depending on the size uh, that you're going with. But this is basically what it looks like. And then we typically use uh, cinder blocks or some other weight to hold the pipes in place until we cover them with material, pull the blocks away. And the blocks help us to determine the depth of each layer. And we're usually aiming for eight to 10 inches of material on top of each layer of pipes. This is uh, what it looks like when you're about halfway done. Um, this particular one was built in one day by one man all by himself with the help of a small tractor to do the material heavy lifting. Uh, this is a just a basic cross-section diagram of what they look like on the inside. And there's lots of ways to, to do this, um, but the basic <clears throat> concept is heat exchange pipes layered throughout. Air can get underneath. Um, one of the things we've done is the layer, the foundation layer of a system would be large diameter wood chips, and then you can put um, the four inch perforated corrugated drain pipe coiled throughout that foundation layer to make sure air can get underneath the whole mound, and then do a few feet of uh, the hot mix material that would be fine grain or shredded bark mulch, and then start laying um, your pipes. Just kind of reminding us all, again, what we're talking about here. We're talking about compost and, and this basic concept of what, what's going on in the composting process. And there's actually a lot of uh, science and, and expertise in Vermont. I think Vermont, this is probably another thing that we're leading the nation with in terms of people who've been studying and working in compost production um, and, and studying the science of the culture of what these microbes are and what they're doing and, and what types of cultures are alive and thriving at different temperatures and what types of respiration is happening. Uh, one of the big possibilities that we haven't um, documented yet is that the carbon and nitrogen ratio of the compost a year later with a pretty much only carbon input in terms of the wood without any nitrogen being added, without any food scraps or manure, um, that the microbial process pulls in nitrogen out of the air as it's doing its thing and fixes that nitrogen into the material so that you get a, a balanced carbon nitrogen, basically um, crop ready compost without any animal inputs. Uh, that, that's actually a pretty big deal if that turns out to be true. Um, especially because there's no um, turning and, and mixing that's required with this process. Um, if you were to interview or visit a compost production facility like Grow Compost in Middlesex or Vermont Compost in Montpelier, they're typically turning bark mulch and wood chips and food scraps into uh, ready to sell compost in a three to five month process, which is 
heavy, intense turning and stirring on a weekly basis to get the aeration to reach all the material and to, to get it to happen quickly. This process is quite a bit slower, but way less energy in terms of material handling um, and potentially yielding a, a better end compost as a result. Without this being the only way we can fertilize uh, our soils without chemicals. Um, you know, Vermont's best soil fertility resource is not necessarily cows eating grass. Um, as we've seen, the state is more than 75% forested. So how do we use that resource in a sustainable way um, to get beyond this being our best option? The basic process of digesting woody biomass can start with some mechanical work, uh, breaking the material down into fine grain uh, texture. Um, and, you know, I think the aesthetic question is one issue that um, this, this does make a little bit of a mess in your yard while you're building it. We actually have a few designs that we're looking for some uh, funding for to help do some tests in ways to containerize the concept. In theory, it could be built in a dumpster or another type of container or a silo like what um, these guys are using for pellets and wood chips as long as there's a way to get aeration underneath uh, the bottom of that kind of a containerized system we could put pretty cedar shingles on it and you'd be happy to have it right in your front yard um, that stuff feels doable it's every time you you get into that you're going to add some upfront cost. One of the beautiful things about this right now is you're talking about a few hundred dollars worth of pipe and a day or two of some work and that's about it. A little bit of the history, um, this whole idea came about in the mid to late 70s uh, from a man named Jean Pen who lived in southern France and it was initially known as the pain method. Um, I've stopped calling it that because it just doesn't have a positive ring to it, but uh, Jean Pen was one of the most innovative, uh, self-taught scientists, farmer, foresters that you'd probably ever run into. Um, he, in the early 80s, he died, cheap oil came back, we all forgot about renewable energy, it seems, um, and so we're trying to bring this back, but he went way beyond just making heat. He also and his biggest focus was actually putting a batch digester in the middle of each mound. So a biogas digestion to make natural gas um, can be done, but the temperature of that uh, tank needs to be kept between 100 and 120 degrees, which in a northern climate like we're at requires lots of energy input and lots of engineering and lots of operation and maintenance. And that's why cow power doesn't really work unless you go mega scale and it's a big capital investment. This is still the only example in known human history of a small-scale uh, biogas production concept that could be done in northern climates. And he made, he doubled the energy value of each of his systems from the gas. He ran his whole farm on the natural gas, converted all his tractors, vehicles, made all of his own electricity with generators that he ran on the natural gas cooked with it as well, um, and was completely energy independent while he ran his large farm on the compost that this whole process produced. So we hope to get some of the biogas experiments going on this winter. Um, there's actually some fairly simple ways to do it, and a couple of the people on our team <coughs> are uh, experienced with cow power, uh, methane systems. So. That's probably the most exciting piece of this potential. Uh, our focus at this point has been just trying to get the, the heat predictable so that we can get some confidence in terms of what you can expect with a certain size system to heat a certain size space or a certain uh, size greenhouse. This diagram just kind of is a drawing that shows uh, Jean Payne was storing his natural gas in uh, tractor tire inner tubes, literally stacked up near the system, which uh, I get a kick out of. I don't know if that would get approved by the uh, zoning administrators, but um, it's a funny story. This is a picture of the first one that we built in 2009. This is from 
Uh, a recent project, um, I've been teaching classes about this through Yestermoral. This was at Dave Hartshorn's uh, Santa Davida farm on Route 100. Uh, the plumbing in the greenhouse isn't done yet, but his goal is to heat one of his 75-foot uh, greenhouses by running radiant tubes in the seed beds. Uh, the mound was made with a mixture of about half wood chips and half sawdust with a little bit of yak manure that we uh, carefully blended in. Um, right now it's still holding steady at 140 to 145 degrees, um, but again we haven't started pulling heat out of it into the greenhouse. This is one from Vermont Compost. Uh, a week ago we helped them build one uh, and my son was taking a break and keeping warm by sitting on this big pile of uh, steaming bark mulch, which was fun. The uh, Vermont Compost style that we did last week is not a round circular mound, it's a long windrow and we zigzagged the pipes on each layer, uh, which is just as easy to do. And he's uh, planning to heat his greenhouse as well as hoping he can heat, uh, or at least partially heat, his office building and home. This is on North Main Street in Montpelier, which I believe makes Vermont the only state in the world that has its state capital with a uh, compost-powered greenhouse on the Main Street. Um, I think the, the greenhouse focus is really the biggest and most exciting application for this, uh, the possibility of uh, Vermont producing food year-round uh, without fossil fuels and without, um, you know, I'm sure these systems would always need other heating backup systems, um, but the fuel costs could be pretty much eliminated in theory. And the output again is soil fertility um, while also kind of pre providing a market for the residues from the forest that right now don't have a, a steady uh, market for. So I think the big picture is pretty exciting. Um, the idea of small scale decentralized natural gas production is also really exciting. It's very easy to convert any vehicle to run on natural gas. Um, any propane appliance can be converted as well. So, you know, the whole energy picture here of producing our own heat and replacing fossil fuels directly uh, while making healthy soil is a pretty exciting uh, proposition. Compostpower.org, again, it's a, a completely volunteer network of people who've got expertise in one area or another, uh, people who are trying this and helping each other. Um, if you're interested in trying one of, this, uh, one of these out at a site, um, we're happy to provide any free advice. We've got a do-it-yourself design guide on the website that walks through a step-by-step -step process. Um, at this point, I also want to give a, a plug to Sunwood Biomass. Uh, Dave and Mark have given us constant support, technical assistance, material help, uh, let me borrow equipment on a whole bunch of our projects, and uh, these guys really see the opportunity for biomass to mean lots of things um, beyond just what it means today, um, and this is one of those things. Um, so, thank you. Excellent. So I want to thank all the speakers, and they're going to come up and uh, do a, uh, a question and answer. Thank you for bringing the extra chair. Um, we do have a microphone in the center here, and this is being taped by Matter River Valley Television. So uh, would appreciate it if you came up to the microphone to speak so that uh, everyone can hear it and that is recorded as well. Um, so we've had a, a fairly broad uh, topic here, um, from forests to education. Uh, looking at uh, high t uh, technology to to compost, um, so uh, obviously biomass is a really broad topic.
country in South America. And I will explain this, but also I want to introduce this lovely lady. Uh, her name is Ruth Wilson, and she is originally from Long Island, New York. She is to move here. Uh, we are fingers and talking to this lady, Amber, today to see. <laughs> Climate Action Network, uh, and uh, the focus of these talks is to continue the dialogue of energy in the Mad River Valley by bringing community members together on a variety of different topics. Um, our first event uh, back in the beginning of September focused on uh, energy planning and the context for, uh, for, for planning uh, on, the, folk, on the, the topic of energy. The second was on solar. The third was on fine energy financing and the state energy plan and, uh, th and this evening we'll, we're going to be talking about biomass. The last event in the series uh, will be focusing on energy efficiency, weatherization and conservation and that'll take place on December 13th. Um, this evening uh, we are going to have four different presentations. Um, we'll be going uh, more like eight, about eight, 845 or so um, is what we're aiming for. Uh, the first will be uh, a Matter of Valley Biomass Analysis. It's a summary of work related to a community biomass project, a partner project of UVM, Family Forest, and the National Forest Alliance. Uh, we'll hear from Cecilia Danks and Susanna McCandless, both uh, PhDs for, uh, from the University of Vermont. Um, we'll next hear from Kimberly Coleman, who is doing her thesis project at UVM in the Natural Resources Department on uh, a, a project that came out of the project, uh, and that's related to Harwood Union Forest uh, Project. Our third presentation will be Dave Frank from Sunwood Biomass. He'll be uh, providing uh, an overview of different biomass uh, units uh, and, uh, and different types of heating systems from chips to pellets. And then lastly, we'll hear from Galen Brown, uh, part of the Compost Power Network, who will be talking about the uh, Woody Biomass Comp project uh, that he um, has been doing on his own property and also at, um, in other areas in Vermont, um, heating with wood without burning wood. So uh, we'll be, like I said, roughly uh, about an hour, about an hour and 20 minutes or so uh, will be the presentations. We'll do, be doing them back and then at the end we will have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. So without further ado, um, I'm going to have Cecilia and or Susanna come up. Hi, I'm Cecilia. Um, should I use, are you trying to record it? Should I use that or should I yes. just talk? It would be great if you use the microphone for the time this works. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, good evening. Um, oh, how do I get mine up? You're going to do that. Okay. While it's coming up, um, we put some little index cards around and hope that um, people can use them throughout the evening tonight. Um, I'll ex be explaining a little bit later in the presentation, but I'd like your input on what questions you have around wood biomass energy and whether there are any research needs that you um, anticipate. If you don't have a writing implement, we have a bunch over there and we can bring one to you. If you don't have a card, we have extra cards in the front. So um, any... Uh, Anybody want a card or a pen? So again, you can write questions whether we answer them or not that you're interested in um, about wood biomass energy. And um, I'll collect them at the end. If you want an answer to your questions, you can add an email address and we'll do the best we can. Otherwise, we're going to be using them for a research project around um, community information needs in wood biomass energy. All right. <clears throat> So I point this at that one and it goes, excellent. So obviously there's growing interest in using um, wood and other forms of biomass for energy, not only for the increasing price 